Hey everybody! Welcome to this very special video. I'm so excited and grateful that I've finally passed the 100 subscriber milestone, and actually as I'm filming this, I'm coming up on the 200 subscriber milestone, which is absolutely insane. Originally, this video was planned as a 100 subscriber special, but it's taken me a little longer than I originally planned to get it together, so we'll call it a almost 200 subscriber special. Editing Joshua from the future here, when I say a little longer than planned, I mean most of this video was filmed back in April. There was so much footage to go through that it's just taken me a long time to edit it. In the footage that you're about to see, if you notice that my beard goes from being quite long right now to being quite short back then, that's why. I thought that for my 100 subscribers special, I should give you a tour of my studio and kind of go into a little bit of my process and how I make these videos. At the same time, you may be wondering, where in the world am I right now? For those of you real fans who pick up on little details, you might notice that this is the same trailer that I recorded Let It Snow in a while back. Well, I know I've always pushed myself as a hardcore Coloradan, but recently I had the opportunity to move down to the state of New Mexico to work on a farm, and that's actually where I am right now. Also, I recorded about 99% of this video back home in my studio before I left, so in case you're confused when I say when I moved to New Mexico, that's why. Unfortunately, I've had to downgrade the capacity of my studio quite a bit, but I'm still planning to make videos whenever I have the opportunity. As such, this studio tour is kind of dual purpose. First of all, I wanted to show you what it is that I do and what equipment I use to do it. And secondly, I wanted a recording of it for myself so that I can look back in the future and remember all the happy memories I made there. At this point, I don't know whether I'll be moving back to Colorado permanently or not, and I certainly don't know whether I'll be in my studio again, but I'm very thankful for the time that I did have there. Last thing before we get to the real video, if you're interested in making covers yourself, don't think that all of the equipment that I'm about to show you is necessary to be able to do that. I'm in a very unique position where a number of very special friends of mine have lent stuff to me that I wouldn't otherwise have access to. And it's because of their generosity that I've been able to do as much as I have. But when it comes down to it, you really don't need all this stuff. So, without further ado, <laughs> let's get to this countdown. And uh, I think I'm going to put a little counter on the screen, just because it's kind of amusing to me how many instruments this is. First of all, we have my trusty guitar which I have had for, I think, a little bit more than maybe two years now. I got this about three months after starting guitar. A friend of mine lent me his, and after I had started playing for a little while, I just got so completely hooked, and I'm like, okay, I gotta buy one. So this is a Yamaha FX335C. Nothing super duper fancy, but it does sound pretty good. And uh, you've heard it in more videos than probably any other instrument that I have. Um, this is sort of my baby, for lack of a better term. I love this thing. Next on the list, also a guitar. I've got this, uh, what is this thing? Yamaha CGX 171 SCF. This is a classical guitar um, that I'm borrowing from my friend Michael. And uh, this thing is great. I love classical for finger style. Let me go ahead and show you what it sounds like really quick. So this thing is great. Um, I think I've really only used it in one video as of the time we're shooting this. And that is the cover that I did of Everything's Alright from To The Moon. But you can hear more of that there if you would like. So last in my list of guitars, this here is a random, uh, I guess it's an Ibanez, YPF10-12 performance 12 string guitar. It is not very good. The uh, neck has been broken off of it and then glued back. <laughs> so uh, it's not in the best shape ever, but um, it is definitely playable. 12 string really isn't my skill set, but uh, I thought, well, might as well give it a shot. This is another one of those instruments from Michael that I'm borrowing.
The next thing on this list is this Siegel Merlin dulcitar, also known as a mountain dulcimer. And this I'm borrowing from my good friend Adam, so I'm gonna probably have to give it back. But uh, it has this really nice, really nice folk sound. And uh, for right now, I think the primary thing that I've used it in is The Optimist by Lauren Marie. So the next thing on my wall uh, is this here U bass. And this thing is mine, so I get to take it with me, thankfully. And I am not a professional bass player by any stretch of the imagination, but I like this thing because it is really small, but it has the, uh, the range of a normal bass. So uh, really quick, I'm gonna plug it in and you can hear what it sounds like. So since I'm not a professional bass player, that's about all I'm gonna show. But um, that is this, and this thing, specifically in case you're wondering, is a, uh, it's a Hayden U bass, spelled H-A-D-E-A-N. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not exactly sure the model, but you could probably find it in the description of this video because in case you didn't know, I always put all of the gear that I use in the description of all my videos. This here is the first stringed instrument that I ever got. This is my Mitchell MU100 concert ukulele. I've used this for a number of things. One of the most notable is Tourist, a love song in Paris by John Cozart that I covered. Um, but this thing showed up in, in a number of things. Uh, usually it's sort of a, an adjunct to the main recordings, but uh, since this is sort of my first introduction into strings, uh, it definitely holds a special place in my heart. So I guess it's only natural that my next instrument on the list here is my baritone ukulele. This thing, I bloom in love, man. Um, this instrument has such a nice round full tone. Uh, it was hard to get used to at first because the tuning is different from that, so it's the same shapes, but this on here is actually a D, like it is on the guitar, whereas this on that thing is a G. Um, and then this is a G on this instrument, like it is on the guitar, but on that thing, it's a C. So it was really confusing at first, but um, I pretty much got it down. It just has such a nice sound. One of the most notable songs that I've recorded on this is It's Under Control by Lauren Marie. And uh, that's actually my most recent video as of the time I'm recording this. I just love this thing. This here is the last of my collection of ukuleles, and it is actually called a banjolele. It's by K Mize. And uh, to be honest, I haven't really used it too much. Uh, it's another one of those things I'm borrowing from Michael. <laughs> but it has a pretty unique sound, and it lets you get kind of a banjo esque feel uh, without having to play a real banjo. It's just played like a normal concert ukulele. So this right here is my Spencer banjo. This one actually is mine, surprisingly enough, though I got it from Michael, so. It's not all that high quality. If you mess with the neck at all, it likes to go completely out of tune. The action is pretty high, but I've wanted to learn banjo for a long time, uh, specifically because of the song Rainbow Connection that Kermit plays in the original Muppet movie. And this has let me do that. I'm surprised I actually was able to pick. That was impressive. <laughs> I haven't done that in months. So next on the list is uh, my other bass. <laughs> 
This one I'm borrowing from my friend Michael, the same guy that I'm borrowing the uh, classical guitar from. And again, I'm no professional bassist, so I really don't super know what I'm doing. Um, but this thing is a five string bass, so I have all the way down to that low B. <laughs> Which I don't even know if the mic can pick that up. Like, it's really stinking low. But I've used this in a number of different things, uh, including Draw Me Close to You and a couple of other videos. So next on the list is my Squire Strat, and uh, this thing is a nice seafoam green, which I will admit is not usually my color aesthetic. Everything in here is like dark black or wood colored. Um, I really like that uh, aged looking rustic feel, um, which this is very much not, but I kind of like it to be honest, it, it, it works. The main video that this has shown up in was Draw Me Close to You. Uh, with my friend Elisha. But other than that, I don't think it's really had all that much of an appearance on the channel yet. Uh, I'm gonna do a little demo. This is actually from a song I'm currently writing, so no spoilers yet, but it's a little sneak peek. <laughs> So next on the list of my stringed instruments and guitars, I've got this Epiphone Les Paul Standard. I'm borrowing it from my friend Joe. And I really like how it sounds and it plays pretty nice as well. If you're a real OG fan and you remember my first video about guitars, I showed this one in it. I'm gonna go ahead and play a little bit of the song I've been writing like I did on my Squire. <laughs> So in case you're wondering how I got that particular sound, hopefully it came through the mic okay, uh, I should probably go through my signal chain really quick. So this here is my primary pedal board setup. The wiring probably could be better. Some of these cables are not very high quality and this one is pretty bent, so ignore that. But <laughs> um, first, uh, everything goes from the right side to the left side. So my guitar input comes in here to the tuner. So if I wanted to tune up, then I could do that. It's not a very great tuner, so to be honest, sometimes I prefer to use my vibration tuner that I just put on the headstock, um, but that's what that is. This right here is my compressor. Um, it is the uh, MXR Dynacomp, and it does a, a really nice job, to be honest. I, I like how it sounds. The, the goal with that is just to compress the sound and, and make it a little bit less dynamic and more full. The next thing here in the list is the Blues Crab by Moore, I think. And that is my overdrive pedal, and it sounds really nice, in my opinion. Then I've got the Boss Digital Delay DD3. Uh, it's not fantastic, but um, it does your basic delay stuff, and I've been able to get by with it. And then, finally, I've got the Boss Digital Reverb RV5. And this thing has a number of different reverbs, spring, plate, hall, room, and uh, also a really nice modulation reverb, which is what I usually like to use. This thing is pretty much always on if I'm recording. These two are generally on, but this thing is, is pretty much always on. And then I'll add less or more reverb depending on what I wanna do. Finally, this cable right here goes to my amp. So this is my main electric guitar amp. It is the Roland Cube 40XL. And it's just a digital amp with some cabinet emulation, but that said, it still sounds really good in my opinion. And I got it for an absolute steal um, off of Facebook Marketplace, so can't complain there. For what it is, this thing has a number of, of pretty reasonable features. There's a, a clean channel, there is a lead, a little bit more high gain channel, and then there's a really high gain solo channel. As far as effects, we have a regular old equalizer, just three, three band, and then chorus, flanger, phaser, tremolo, heavy octave, a pretty reasonable delay looper, although it's not super easy to use. Uh, and then this reverb, which is pretty nice. Um, I like to use that fairly, fairly frequently. While we're at it, I've got a couple other pedals to show off. Um, this right here is the Singular Sound 
Eros Loop Studio. This thing is really stinking expensive and I'm currently borrowing it from my friend Mikhail. I've been able to use it a little bit, but I am no professional looper, so unfortunately I haven't had enough time to really learn it and give it full justice. Kind of on the topic of loopers, I've also got this Jam Man Solo Looper. And it does the same thing as that does, except uh, way simpler and you can't have parts and stuff like, like that one allows you to do. But again, uh, I'm not super good at looping yet, so this is still a world that I want to uh, get into. This is also borrowed from my friend Michael. Next, I've got this Carbon Copy Deluxe uh, by MXR. Uh, I think this is a delay pedal. And I've been able to use it a little bit. It's got a lot of pretty cool features. But uh, to be honest, since my digital delay by Boss is already on my pedal board, I'm like, eh. Uh, sometimes I'll use it, sometimes I won't. I have to have a pretty specific reason to pull it out, though. And I've got this generic foot switch for use with my amp. This makes using the looper on there a little bit easier. But again, it's not something I do super often. Borrowed from Michael. Finally, to cap off my pedal collection, this here is uh, a guitar effects processor, the Boss GT1, which I'm also borrowing from Michael, surprise, surprise. This thing has some really nice tones in it, honestly. I, I really like how it sounds. I haven't gotten to use it tons, because, I mean, honestly, I like what my basic pedal board sounds like. But if I find myself needing a sound that I can't get with any of these other things, I can probably get it with this processor here. So this right here is a, uh, a Roland Microcube Bass RX. This thing is amazing, and I'm borrowing it from Michael. And I like to use it for recording because it's so small. Uh, I mean, it's not the correct way to do it, but um, what I do is I take an output from right here, recording out slash phones, and that's a, a regular quarter inch guitar output that I take and I put into this DI box right here. This DI box then takes that instrument level signal and boosts it up to mic level so that I can record it through my soundboard and into the computer. In general, this bass amp just sounds really, really good anyway, despite it being so small. It's got a number of different effects, several different amp and uh, cabinet emulators, uh, as well as obviously a three band EQ and, and even like, I think there's like a drum machine on here too. It's, it's pretty crazy. This is definitely one of my favorite things. It's really helped the recording process go a lot faster. Finally, in my list of amps, I've got this Crate BX100. It's nothing fancy, but the thing just barks. Like, this thing is loud. When you were hearing me play bass earlier, this is what you heard it through. It's relatively basic. There's a send and return channel. There is input, gain, and then there's some master levels and, and stuff. And then there's like this, uh, this mic level out, which is interesting. Don't have a whole bunch of use for that. And then finally, there's this 8-band EQ, which is quite nice. And as you can see, I like to, uh, to boost the bass a little bit just to give a really full, almost acoustic bass type sound, but just really deep and punchy. This is a lot of fun to play, but when I play it, it rattles the room. It's crazy. So next on the list, I'd like to show off my percussion collection. <laughs> it just amuses me that I'm saying that. <laughs> So first on the list is my Meinl, I think it's like a, a Baltic birch type cajon. It's like a, a mini baby cajon, which is kind of funny because I'm over six feet tall, so it's sort of like my knees come up. <laughs> but it's really convenient for the size of room that I have to work with. I had a full-size cajon in here for a while that I was borrowing, but it was just too big and took too much space. So this thing's perfect. Uh, it sounds really good too. Now, when I'm actually recording this stuff, I usually like to take the instruments out of the room because there's too much resonation going on. Uh, but you got the idea of what it sounds like. This, when I went into Guitar Center, was the first thing that really caught my eye. And when I played it, I'm like, oh, this sounds so good. And the best thing is, it was on sale. So I got it for like 50 bucks. <laughs> so it was great. If I want to add a little bit more swing or a little bit more jazzy, soft feel to my songs, I also have these Vader Cajon brushes. And I'm not super great at using them. Um, I'm okay, but... It sounds pretty nice. So on the topic of cajon accessories, I've got this little maraca thing for your shoe. I'm not wearing a shoe, so I can't demonstrate. And I've also got this little foot tambourine for your foot. And both of these add some nice depth to when you're playing with a cone. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at it, so I haven't really been able to take full advantage of those, but they're nice to have. Those are also borrowed from my friend Michael. Before we move on from cajones, I just got to show you this. It's really fun. 
up here in my little locker setup, I've got my little ooh, -ooh monkey uh, that is next to this little tiny cajon. <laughs> And it just so happens to perfectly match the cajon I'm currently sitting on. Um, this thing is not just for show, but it's not a real cajon either. Um, this thing's actually a shaker. Um, I haven't really used it in anything, but it's super fun to have because as you can tell, it's exactly the same to this Meinl cajon. They're both the same kind of wood, same company, same design. This one just has the Meinl in the middle. I've got this Meinl shaker right here. This thing is fantastic. I love the really soft sound that it gives. So next on the list of my percussion instruments, we've got this Darbuka, also known as a Doombek here in the United States. It is a traditional Turkish instrument and it sounds really, really good. I have only used it in one video and that is Draw Me Close to You. Sounds really nice. Surprise, surprise, borrowed from my friend Michael. So we've got this snare here. Usually I have a stand that I can put it on. I'm not usually gonna play it on my lap, clearly, but I didn't wanna go through the effort of setting that up for this video. And I'm borrowing this for the intent to learn how to play brush snare, because oh my goodness, it is my favorite sound for drums. It just is so good. Turns out it's a little bit harder than you would anticipate to learn though. So I've got a lot of respect for real drummers that can do that. As such, this hasn't shown up in any videos. Finally, on my list of random percussion instruments, I have this uh, rain stick that I'm borrowing from Michael. And I've got these claves that I'm borrowing from Michael. So next on the list, I'm gonna talk about my wind collection. <laughs> First is this really stupid bamboo thing, which honestly isn't even worth being called an instrument. I mean, it sounds just trash. <laughs> it's just garbage. But I like adding it to the list because that means I can say I have one more instrument in my room. Next, I've got these two recorders. This one my mom learned on in school. This one I got used somewhere I don't even know where. I don't honestly know where it even came from. It's just here. <laughs> I'm no professional recorder player. These haven't made an appearance in any videos, but I do have them. Next up, we have my two harmonicas. This one here is the one that I grew up playing with my dad. Uh, he used to play harmonica back in the day. He's got a much bigger one than me. Uh, this one is just a, a real basic blues band C scale harmonica. But I used to play this thing all the time growing up. Now it really doesn't get much use, which is kind of sad. I don't know, maybe it'll show up in a video. I have it. Then I've got this old school antique harmonica that I believe was owned by my great grandmother's brother. So this thing is probably close to a hundred years old by now. It sounds really nice, but I think it needs work done because uh, some of the reeds seem to be out. It's got a really nice vibrato sound. I love it. Actually, I technically have three harmonicas if you count the little one on my keychain. Uh, this one has about eight notes, and it was given to me by Mariah, who's a friend of mine for my birthday. It's not exactly something I can use in a cover since it's so small, but not gonna lie, it's fun to have a little instrument that I carry with me all the time. It does actually play though, so here's what it sounds like. <laughs> really high. This is what it looks like up close. Also, another thing I forgot to mention while I was up in my studio up north is this little choo-choo whistle. I've had it since I was literally like, I don't know, two or three. I've had it forever. And originally I didn't make the list, but when I saw someone else put it on their instrument roundup list, I thought, whatever, I can count it as another instrument if they're gonna do that. This thing actually sounds really great. Maybe one of these days if I cover something by Johnny Cash or whatever, it'll make an appearance. I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> to be honest, I think this thing sounds a lot better than the ones they make these days. So getting a little bit bigger, next on the list is this Yamaha clarinet. And honestly, I really love the sound of clarinet. Um, I'm not super good at this yet, and I haven't practiced in a long time, so I can't really demonstrate it for you. But this is another one of those things I have. And guess what? It's borrowed from Michael. I might insert a little clip of me playing it just so you can hear what it sounds like here.
finally, on my list of wind instruments that I have access to, uh, this is, I think, an alto saxophone. To be honest, I haven't had time to learn it, which is really a bummer because I've wanted to play sax forever. And now I finally have access to one, I just don't have time to learn it, which is just sad. Um, which is why I'm probably holding it completely wrong. <laughs> I'm sure the comments will tell me as much. And there's no read in here, for, in case you were noticing. But maybe one day I'll have the chance to play it, maybe not. I'll probably have to return it because, once again, this is Michael's. So, moving on to my keyboard collection. This here is my SD Junior from the 1940s. And it's technically considered a portable instrument. As you can see, it's not super big. But honestly, it's probably somewhere around 90 to 100 pounds. The thing is not light, so it's, it's not as portable as you would think. Uh, but with a couple people, you can move it pretty easy. Despite the tiny little size of this thing, it is so capable. This is one of my favorite instruments. So in case you don't know anything about reed organs, I'll do a little bit of explaining really quick. This thing has two ranks of reeds. This little knee lever opens a damper on the back rank, and that allows it to sound a little bit more full, a little bit more loud. And this one right here opens a entirely separate set of reeds right here. It's got one eight foot set and one four foot set. And then obviously you play it by pumping these pedals. Eventually I've got to recover the bellows on the inside. I did just get a couple of supplies, so hopefully soon it will be able to play a little bit easier. But I haven't quite gotten to that yet. For right now I still have to pedal fairly quickly. But here's what it sounds like. <laughs> So this right here is my 1921, I believe, Hinner's Chapel model reed organ. This is sort of the granddaddy of the little tiny one that I have upstairs. Dif two different companies though. This thing was built to be used in a church, so it is very capable. It has 15 stops, uh, four of those are effect stops, and then the rest of them are sounding stops. This thing I've gone through like crazy. I've practically rebuilt half of it. Um, there's still some work I need to do, clearly. The keyboard needs to be leveled. Uh, there's still some linkages inside I need to work on. And the biggest thing is that there are a couple of gaskets that still leak too much. So once I get those fixed, it'll be back to its former glory. But for right now, it's at least playable. Let me give you a little demo. <laughs> So this here is our Jesse French and Sons spinet piano. We've had this thing forever. Used to be the churches uh, that we used to go to back in Pennsylvania, and now it's ours.
So this right here is uh, the MIDI interface that I use in order to play virtual instruments into my digital audio workstation, which is Cakewalk right here. And this is called the Arturia Key Step. It's actually really quite nice. Um, I like the feel of the keys. It's really convenient to have something so small on my desk that I can use. It's not very easy for me to demonstrate, so you'll just have to take my word for it. But this thing is a great piece of gear. So as far as MIDI interfaces go, this is the second one that I have. This is an electric keyboard. Specifically, it's the Yamaha uh, P80. And this is actually owned by Noah, the guy behind the camera. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. And obviously this is going to go back to him um, whenever I go down to New Mexico. The key weight on here is quite nice. It feels good to play. If I want to play anything that takes more than two octaves, this is the thing that I use. It's really nice. So, on to the recording process. This right here is my Multimix 8 USB uh, by Alesis, and this is what I use primarily to interface with my DAW over here. There are four primary XLR channels, some basic EQ that I can do, but I prefer to do most of that in post, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that I don't use so much anymore. I used to take advantage of these uh, tape ins and outs with the RCA, but not so much these days. This is what I record the bass through um, after it's gone through the DI box. This here is another audio interface I happen to be borrowing. This is from Mikhail, the other one I own. Uh, this one is the Complete Audio 6 by Native Instruments. I've had some problems getting it to work right, so sometimes I use it, but generally I don't. It's a very nice sounding low noise interface though. So this is my primary mic when I'm doing overdubs and things directly into my DAW. This is the Sterling Audio S50. Um, I guess it's Class A. F-E-T, whatever that means. And this is primarily what I use to sing if I'm doing harmonies or those types of things into my DAW. This particular mic has been graciously lent to me by my friend Joe, and it's made a huge difference in my recording quality. I really do use it in almost every project. When I was talking about my microphones and audio interfaces up north, I completely forgot to mention a number of the microphones I use on a rather regular basis, so I'm gonna go ahead and round those up now. First, we've got the Sterling Audio S30 Class A FET, which again, I'm not sure what that means. I believe this is a pencil condenser microphone, and this is an instrument microphone. It actually came in a set with that large diaphragm Sterling condenser microphone I just talked about. I believe this thing has a cardioid pickup pattern. It hasn't actually been used in any of my videos yet, but it's something I have in case I need it. Next, we've got this old school AKG D1000E, and this is a dynamic microphone. This thing is seriously old school. I don't know how old it is. I think it's 70s or 80s, but it's old. I've used it for a number of things, in particular, miking the Darbuka or Doombeck in Draw Me Close to You. I assume it would also do a decent job at miking some kind of electric guitar amp, but I haven't actually tried that yet. While we're on the subject of miking electric guitar amplifiers, I actually have a microphone that's specifically for that purpose. This is the Sennheiser E609 Silver, and this thing is my primary mic if I want to record electric guitar. What you do is you plug in an XLR cable and then you hang it right in front of the cabinet, and it basically just goes right there. Also, this is another dynamic microphone of mine since it's designed for use at high volume at close proximity. Despite being rather inexpensive, I think it sounds quite good, so this is definitely something that I use on a regular basis if I'm doing full production covers. The last dynamic microphone I have is this really old, not very good, realistic highball microphone. And I don't really use it for very much, but it's something that I have in case I need a dynamic for drums or something else. Finally, this is the microphone I was just using to record that last clip. This is my primary workhorse when I'm doing client projects and really fancy schmancy sit down videos. It's the Rode NTG2 shotgun mic, and I think it sounds really, really good. I haven't used it for very much on this channel though. This right here is my Zoom H5 audio recorder. This thing is probably my most favorite piece of audio gear that I own. This is my workhorse recorder that I use to do all of the live takes and stuff that I do usually as the foundational piece of whatever cover I'm recording. These XY mics are absolutely incredible quality. And to be perfectly honest, if I had to give up every other piece of audio equipment that I own, this is the thing that I would keep. It is so, so good. If you want one of these, it's worth the money. So this right here is the camera we've been shooting this entire video on, and that is what my primary rig looks like most of the time. Uh, we've got my Canon 60 Mark II, 
and a Tamron 24 to 70 f 2.8 lens. Absolutely fantastic lens. On top of it, we have my Rode VideoMic Pro, and that is used for in-camera audio so that I can sync it with the stuff that I get out of the H5. So finally, that brings us to my post-production process. All of my mixing and mastering is generally done here inside Cakewalk, which I already mentioned. Generally, if I'm recording audio on the H5, I will do some pre-processing in Adobe Audition first. That's actually what this is right here. But then, once this is finished, I will import that into Cakewalk and add things to it as well as adding my plugin chain um, to make it sound really nice. Finally, when all of this is done and the recording is finished, I'll render that down into a single stereo track and bring it into Premiere. And this is one of the projects that I've been working on lately. We might have to reshoot it. I'm not 100% uh, decided on it yet. But I'll then take that audio and sync it with the video that I shot uh, with the camera that my cousin Noah is currently shooting with. And then I, I may edit it really fancy. I may not. Uh, but then this is exported and uploaded to YouTube as the final product. If you actually made it all the way through this video, thanks so much. I hope it helped you. I hope it was interesting. I hope it helps you on your own musical journey. Now, keep in mind, half this stuff is completely unnecessary if you want to make your own covers or videos or whatever on YouTube or otherwise. But having this stuff definitely helps me when I want to pick a particular tone to get across a certain feeling in a piece of music. To be honest though, if you have your main instrument, like a guitar, an audio recorder, and a laptop, as well as your phone, you're going to do just fine. But I will say, having access to all this stuff has made a huge difference in my own musicianship, my understanding of how all of these things work, and my understanding of how to arrange for different instruments. I really, really have to give a huge shout out to all of the incredible people who have been so generous in letting me borrow half of this stuff. First, I'd like to thank my friend Joe. He has been absolutely incredible in teaching me how to play. I'm mostly self-taught, but he's taught me a lot of specific things about guitar that's really helped. And he's let me borrow the condenser mic that I showed you, as well as that Epiphone electric Les Paul. Secondly, I'd like to thank my friend Mikael. He's been a huge help in lending me half the stuff in this room. I mean, his generosity is just ridiculous. Also, I'd like to thank Adam for letting me borrow the dulcitar. And finally, I have to thank my friend and cousin Noah, who is currently shooting this video. And we've been sitting here for like literally three hours going through all of this stuff. So his patience is much appreciated. Also, he let me borrow the, uh, the electric piano and I've been very, very, very grateful for that. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this insane video. Hope you enjoyed. See you next time. This is the hardest part of the whole video. There we go. I got it. It's twisted, but whatever. Uh, waiting for the heater.